I thought we could start with the English because it's one of the more common openings. Mm -hmm. I was thinking there, there's two openings that you could try to achieve because you're, you're a Benoni player, but you're also a Grand Prix player. Mm -hmm. I was thinking like reverse Grand Prix is probably the, the pick that would be most up your alley. Mm -hmm. And the problem with, with being a Benoni player against C4, you can't always get a Benoni structure because usually white keeps the D-pawn back. Mm -hmm. Like I noticed in one of your recent games, you played Knight F3, your opponent played D3. And you started thinking forever. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, you don't want to take five minutes on move two. You want to have some game plan in mind. Mm -hmm. I think the great thing about just playing e5 against c4 is that normally, okay, at least my recommendation, if you pursue it, there's a very simple setup to play. You're, it's essentially just a reverse Grand Prix. You're down a tempo, so there's some, some differences. Um, but in many cases, you'll still have these attacking ideas on the king's side because most english players will usually develop like bishop uh g3 bishop g2 yeah. and then you'll still get some attacking potential okay so basically this is a reverse grand three got it yeah and i can actually rename this chapter uh reverse grand pre reverse english um so i can show you just some like introductory lines <laughs> And this is, I will say, this is one of the very first openings I learned against English. Um, maybe I should change around the move order, but usually things can transpose. White can start with knight c3 or g3. Um, usually a combination of these. And I recommend f5 early, mm, which no might seem game. risky. Mm -hmm. uh, but normally, okay, against most English players, you'll get this setup. And this is where things can start deviating. Most players will play e3 in this position, which is actually a move you would usually like to see because there's a very cool response, which maybe you, you've already saw what I had input, but uh, the response here is pawn d5, mm -hmm. which can catch a lot of players off guard because white has three attackers on d5, mm -hmm. and you only have two defenders. Uh, the nice thing about d5 is it's a completely sound move, because there's many cases, like if white tries to win the pawn, you'll have this resource knight b4. Mm -hmm. And d3 is actually quite weak. Mm -hmm. So just to illustrate, let's say c take d5, knight b4. Uh, you have an immediate threat of knight d3. And there's really only one good move in this position for white, uh, which not everyone plays. But I'll pose the question to you. What's, what's really the only reasonable move for white um d3 just get back on yeah d3 is um is really the only move for white i could just show some other options um a lot of players will go wrong by playing d4 just trying to open the center uh but this is really bad after e4 and then the knight is coming to d3 mm -hmm. and i've had games which very quickly go in black's favor, like white plays knight e2, and then knight d3 check, and the king f1, and then knight g4, and f2 is falling. So uh, white has to be a bit more cautious from earlier. Mm -hmm. I've also had games where players will play queen a4 and forget that the knight is defended by the bishop. So mm -hmm. then after bishop d7, uh, knight d3 will come, followed by e4, and also a great position for for black. Um, so d3 only move, you can win the back of the pawn. The sneakiest move to play might feel more natural to play knight b take d5, uh, but the sneakier and, and, in my opinion, the better move is knight, take, uh, knight f take d5. Mm. And the reasoning is now you have a threat in this position, and actually, again, white only has one good move in this position. Everything else for white uh, would be a blunder. Uh, so, what's really the only move for white here? I'm trying to see the, the threat. Threat is to win the d3 pawn? Exactly. Got it. So, to defend it, you have to capture the knight yourself? Uh, yeah, white has to capture. Mm, I see. And this this can be very effective in blitz, because a lot of players will just assume there's no threat, play knight e2, and then you're, you take on c3, take on d3, and you're happy. Um, 
Well, okay, if White realizes has to take, then you take back. And it's a very playable position. I mean, you have more space. You provoked White to play d3, so sometimes the structure is a little bit weak, especially the d3 pawn. Whenever e3 and g3 are played, there's some additional weaknesses. And you have a very simple uh, simple completion of development. Like c6 is a very useful move to uh, support the knight and try and undermine the, the white bishop. And your bishops come in the center, you castle. Um, and it's a very reasonable middle game. Nice. And, yeah, black scores also, like, the scores are, I think, quite well here for black in the database. Um, at least based on, uh, based on approximately 100 games that have reached this position. Um, okay, sometimes again, you can't always trust, like, the highest level games, but, uh, certainly very playable for black. Sure. And you play this in tournaments as well? Like, when you, play, when you said you first learned this? Uh, when I first learned this, yes. Um, uh, yeah. I, I had reasonable success with it, very good success online in the, the quicker time controls, because a lot of players would just start thinking after d5. Mm -hmm. And I can show also, like, there, I would run into many cases where white would take on d5, not with a pawn, but like with a knight. And you can see this is, uh, this is quite high scoring for black. Mm -hmm. Um, cause black's essentially gonna use the same idea if you take again. And whenever white takes back with, you're going to play knight before next. Yeah, and win it back. So, yeah, if, uh, like, if c take d5, knight before. And again, the whole point is accessing the d3 square. I have to find a game. There was a game I played, like, three or four years ago. My opponent played queen to b3, attempting to keep everything under control and, and hold on to the pawn. Um, but then, of course, again, e4, very common theme, and, okay, black is having all the fun. And also, like, either w getting knight d3 or winning the pawn back. It's a nice position. Okay, I dig it, I dig it. I can totally play this, yeah. And I wonder, instead of e3, what if they play, like, knight f3 or, I don't know, z yeah. So what are the other common things here? Yeah, knight f3 is certainly a move that will sometimes be played early. I'm thinking about, like, this specific position, it could just run into e4. Mm. I don't know if e4 is overextending, but e4 looks attractive. Maybe d3 first, then? So, yeah, this is another main line. Like, most often you'll run into d3 or e3. Oh, like, that's why that guy played d3. Because it's, it's actually a, a line. I thought it was just, like... I so, he, uh, yeah. Yeah. When he played g3, it was it was very early. Like usually, white will play g3 first. Sure. Um, but the whole idea is to get like a reverse Sicilian, um, where white has extra tempo. Mm -hmm. Um, and I I would bet a lot of money that your opponent was either like a, a knight or for dragon player as black. If he's playing c4 d3, he's hoping to transpose into maybe his favorite black opening with an extra tempo. Um. With this line, you don't play like the open Sicilian. Um, you, you keep it more of a closed Sicilian. And, uh, nice thing about that is at, the extra tempo isn't always that important because it, it's more focused on what setup you're employing. And it doesn't get tactical right away, at least in this line. And the move I recommend here is bishop to b4, where usually if you're provoked, you'll take on c3. Mm -hmm. And then it'll be the same setup of like, and yeah. then you'll you'll be familiar with the structure and yeah. all of the attacking ideas, like queen e8, queen h5. So I, I included a game here, a really nice game by uh, a really strong grandmaster, who is actually one of my favorite players to observe his openings because he plays really offbeat stuff for a very high level player. Um, it was a game of Richard Rapport, and okay, he played this with very good success uh, as black. And this game, like, white played naturally, like, a3, bishop takes c3, and then black essentially employed all of, like, the thematic kind of attacking maneuvers uh, in the early middle game. Um, like, okay, e3, so starting with queen h8, or queen e8, and uh, eventually queen h5. Um, also, king h8, very useful move to uh, to keep the king out of danger 
uh, especially like sometimes this diagonal can be weak uh, when you play f5 so early. And um, okay, the setup was nice. It, it still took work to win the game. Um, white played b5. It's very common. Like when white expands on the queen side, you just maneuver your knight towards the king side. And white played queen to d2 here. Now there is an interesting moment here where black is leaving the b7 pawn undefended. And I didn't have a chance to analyze this too extensively, but if white takes on b7, maybe we can we can try and identify what black would do in this position. There, there are a few few interesting attacking ideas. Sure. Um, knight g4 is, to... is, the, is the most attractive. You said pawn e4? Uh, no, knight g4, sorry. Oh, knight g4. Oh, yeah. Knight, g, knight to g4 is threatening made in one. Um, and probably forcing h4. Yeah, that can be met maybe with g5 or... g5... Yeah, that's probably the most like aggressive approach. Is there another less direct way that's probably more subtle but effective? Huh. Yeah, I'm I'm looking around, I'm not seeing anything so clear. I was thinking an, another approach is to play f4 to yeah. get the bishop into play, like threats of bishop g4, and black would be sacking the exchange. Maybe it would be worth it. Mm. We can check the engine here, because like engines can be very strong in this position, okay. and see what it uh, recommends. Wow, white. Wow, is... white is better. Whoa. Okay, but from a human standpoint, black is still going to be having some fun. I'm wondering if we, if we just like start digging deep, if the engine will change its mind. <laughs> Rook no, eight eight actually I... seems reasonable. Yeah. The engine is just counting the pawns. It sees whites up a pawn, doesn't see any immediate mates, so it's <laughs> it's liking white. Oh, uh, that's case point eight now. It's, it went from like plus two to point eight. That's actually a really good sign when you like continue to leave the engine running and it will like keep dropping an evaluation in your favor. Yeah. Um, let's yeah let's see knight g four, h four. And sometimes you have to play out the line for it to fully understand. Knight g6 is really interesting because it allows bishop to take h8. Now it's getting insane. Knight you take h4. Take h4. Wow, if you take on h4, then white and black's winning. So f3 is we play. So it's important to understand these lines. Like black is winning because there's no good way to stop uh, queen h2 check yeah. in that variation. What is it saying? Oh, f3. Wow, f3 is such a weird move. Allowing knight take e3. It's not even the best move. Queen, knight take f3 is the best move. <laughs> Wait, what is this line? Ah, f3 also looks really... Yeah, knight take f3, because now the threat is queen h2. So the bishop can't take on f3. The rook has to take on f3. And then still... Probably queen h2 check, king f1, rook take a8. <laughs> black is, wait, black is down a rook? Black's down a rook, and the computer is only saying plus one. Wow. Which is usually a good sign. <laughs> I don't know about this. <laughs> Maybe too risky, but okay, like, in in a practical game, if you're, if you're going into this knowing it's, okay, it's going to be a, a sharp fight... Um, I, I would probably still go into this, realizing that white is walking a very thin tightrope. Yeah. Especially if white takes on e7, it's very, very risky. Wait, I'm actually curious. Uh, I'm going to... Oops. Yeah, if you want to go Fish further in that line. E7. I wonder what happens if knight takes e3. So right here. Oh, because you're down, you're down with material, which is why... Like, white's temporarily up a full rook. Yeah. So. But black gets some material back. Yeah, but white is still better. Um, interesting. Okay. Because you're already. So basically, what the computer is saying, like, you're you're down material. So even if you take on e3, you're gonna win material back, but still be down. Well, the concrete variation is after knight take e3, queen d2, 
you win F1, and then you probably just win A8. The problem is, like, F3 is now defended, so you're not getting as much counterplay. Like, you could take on H4, and you have how many pawns for the piece? You have two pawns for the piece. Uh, It's still playable. Like, white still has to defend accurately. Like, you have ideas of lifting the rook over, and there's no immediate, like, counterplay for white. But, um, yeah, of course the computer's going to prefer white in this position, so. Interesting. Okay, I'll, I'll explore that. That could be fun. Yeah. Of, of course, this isn't, like, a, probably isn't, like, a realistic, like, specific variation to study, but the over the overall ideas in this variation are, are quite interesting, where there, there might be many cases where you allow the b7 pawn to just be undefended and you go for the king side play. And the combination of knight g4, or knight, H, knight to g6, and stacking on h4 uh, is quite interesting. Mm-hmm. Um, we see in this game, white did not want to take the risk. And, okay, white tried to play a bit more in, in controlled fashion with f4, stopping black from playing f4, which is probably the main idea um, in, in many cases. Um, I like what black did. Like It was, it was a kind of positional buildup. But there's always there's always pressure on white. King f2 is kind of unusual. I like knight f8 preparing g5, trying to open up files. And it was somewhat of a grind because it was just it got it became a closed position. Sometimes you have to react to uh, to the structure. And there is a moment in this game. Really unexpected move, but it kind of goes to show the creativity of uh, of Black playing Knight D E five, just sacking a piece, uh, where it can just be taken by a pawn. Um, and White took the piece, given that Knight D three is coming. And the amazing thing was that F four is now about to happen, and, and Black is just crashing through. It's just massive compensation. I'm not sure what the computer would think about this, but uh, it's just really interesting to see that like, black just keeps momentum, even at the cost of material. And then the, the finish is pretty devastating for white. Just losing, losing any shelter that the king had. And the pawns get rolling. Like, this is already just over. Yeah. Um, nice. So anyway, I mean... the. The game itself maybe will offer some interesting ideas, but hopefully this is a starting point at least, where um, I think if you were going to play this line as black, you would want to know this line with bishop c5 and d5. Or sorry, d5 first. Um, if, if they play e3. If they play d3, then you put the bishop on b4 and, and play in, in Grand Prix style. And I think that's a lot more about kind of understanding the, the middle game plans and the knowing like specific lines. Awesome. That's a really good starting point. I'm going to go explore that. Um, yeah, sounds good. And add on to this. I think one of the best approaches is to just find find some high-level games. Like, um, mm-hmm. use uh, the opening explorer, find games where black wins, play through them, and as you start playing through more and more, then hopefully you'll start seeing like recurring ideas, especially in the middle game, how strong players will actually ex- execute these kingside attacks. Mm-hmm. And that's one of the quickest ways to kind of build knowledge in a, a specific opening structure. Mm-hmm. Yeah, totally. Cool. So I, I don't think I want to overwhelm you with like too many other English variations. I think this is like a good starting point, especially because these lines are probably most expected mm-hmm. if you're playing an English player. Mm-hmm. Um, and then over time, like if you run into something a bit different, then you can of course add on to it. Yeah, I'm curious. Before even d5, right here, like what is what is the objectives of this uh, English opening? Or like, what are they trying to accomplish? Like if I didn't know, oh, sure. yeah. Um, well, whites. So when players play the English opening, because I, I used to play the English for many years, it's still in my repertoire. Um, it's a setup-based opening where white usually goes for 92 in castling. And if white accomplishes the setup, then it, it's harmonious. Like um, there would be ideas further of playing d4 for white, expanding in the center, also playing knight d5 because there's so much control over the d5 square, and uh, maybe even the eventual knight 
uh, E to C3. There's also ideas of A, A3, B4. And it's a very positional opening. Um, essentially trying to go for a closed Sicilian, um, where like in these closed Sicilian positions, the main goal is to like control this key center square, in this case D5, in Black's territory, and then expand on the queen side. Um, so a lot of players will play this because it, it's it's different and it's still a, a reasonable approach. Uh, the thing the thing that White has to watch out for though is when Black challenges the setup immediately, and that's why I like to recommend this this D5 line because then White can't really achieve what they usually would like to achieve. Uh, they they have to basically start defending against the uh, the oncoming threats, which is always a nice situation to be in. Okay. Nice. Okay. So C4 players are usually set, have a prefer a positional setup. So by disrupting their setup immediately, they're maybe off more off book or like a little bit less comfortable with playing in my territory, basically. Exactly. And and this line I will say is pretty off beats. Mm, I like it. Most players will not, like, this is not a main line by any means. Um, like, most English players will encounter um, encounter openings intending to, like, transpose into D4 lines. Like, they'll encounter E6, D5, they'll encounter, like, King's Indian. Um, but this is kind of unique to the English, mm. which is uh, which is a nice spot to, to be. Yeah. I'm curious, after E5, I don't normally play E5. Mm -hmm. Is there any chance where this line can transpose a different line where maybe I'm the one that's less prepared? Like he tricked me with C4 and then I play E5, I don't play E5, and they don't use play C4 and they do something. I will say, if you're in doubt, just follow the setup. Like, it, okay, all the arrows drawn. Yeah. At least let me get rid of the arrows. Just like follow this setup. Worst case scenario, I think White might play some move like an early A3. Like, let's actually, let me show you another move. Like, they could trick you and play A3 here. Mm -hmm. And then, let's say this is a tournament, and you're on your own. And you, you can't go for D5 anymore, because A3 is stopping any Knight B4 ideas. What would yeah. you do? Um, I remember in the book, the Grand Prix, the one you recommended me, whenever they play A6 really early, you feed and cattle your bishop. Yeah, so, uh, G6. Yeah, drawing from this will probably do the same. I think that's why it, it's good for you to kind of have already have this experience playing Grand Prix as White, because then you're already familiar with maybe how to react to new moves. Yeah. Um, so G6 is uh, is what I would go for. And then it's more of a closed Sicilian setup. Mm -hmm. uh, there would still be middle game plans of attacking on the king's side. Very common, like after you castle, after you play D6, it's common to play H6, G5, and then maneuver the knight to G6. Also, maybe throw in c6, and then later play f4. Um, so okay. that's another kind of like default setup. Like if the the specific preparation doesn't work out, you can kind of default to the setup. And there's not too many ways that White can throw you off guard. Mm. Um, I mean, you're you're making me think now, like how how White could potentially deviate. Um, maybe there's one line that comes to mind. Which I played myself as my f3 in this position, which is a bit different because most players will feed and cattle the light squared bishop right away. Um, this is a move to be prepared for. Um, I wouldn't prioritize it when learning the English, but it's good at least not to be completely thrown off guard. Where let's say you play f5 now, then White can play d4, and then the center is challenged immediately, and now now the ball is kind of in your court. Do you take on d4? Or do you play e4? Do you try and defend your e-pawn somehow? Um, what would be your first impression here? I feel like white would be better. Just mm -hmm. center of control, my f-pawn is out, <laughs> and my center is being... Um, Fair enough. Yeah. I will say that this is another kind of opening line. It, it's kind of offbeat for both sides, because mm. white usually doesn't doesn't play knight f3 as a main move, and black doesn't play f5 as a main move. Um, so we're entering kind of a, a lesser-known variation. Like, if you pick a random chess player off the street, they probably won't know anything about this variation. Um, 
I will say it's very playable for a back. You kind of have to know what you're doing. The best move here is e5, or sorry, e4, to gain space, kick the knights. It is maybe somewhat overextending. Um, now, there's a couple lines here for white. Usually, white will either play knight g5 or bishop g5. I'll, sh <clears throat> I'll show you a fun variation. Let's say bishop g5. You develop, play knight f6. Um, now, white's knight is attacked, and if they play knight d2, which is what they would like to play, you can win d4. Mm -hmm. um, actually, there's a really fun line, funny line that I'm just realizing. Which I don't know if I... I think I've seen this before, actually, but it just came to mind that if you take on d4, white could try and counter with taking on e4. Hmm. And then attack the d4 knight. I was thinking you could somehow sack the queen, but now I'm realizing that doesn't make any sense. Um, not sure. You could take back. Actually, maybe you, you just shouldn't take on d4. You should play something uh, perhaps a bit more sound, like bishop to b4. This would be a reasonable approach. And then just get ready to castle, play this. And it's still somewhat in the style of Grand Prix, where later you want to maneuver your queen to the king's side. Um, I wanted to show a specific line, which it features like a really cool trap, um, really bizarre trap too, where sometimes players will play d5 to counterattack the knight on c6. And um, this, this position has actually never occurred in Lee Chess or the Masters database. Really? Uh, oh. But I, I know it's occurred... I, I have, like, a, a chess-based database with, like, 7 million games or something. I know it's occurred in, in that database. Um, but I guess there, there's no games in either of the Lee Chess databases. Um, anyway, I wanted to show a line where uh, you take the knight, they take your knight, then you take on g2. And it's, it, it's a messy situation, because, like, white's taking your stuff, you're taking white's stuff, and then... What move seems most logical for white here? Like, if you were white, what would be your first impression? Take on d7? Yeah, take on d7 with check, and then recapture on g2. Uh, taking on d7 with check is actually a losing move. Now I want you to think. Black to move, and uh, play the winning move. Um, I bet you something crazy, like, knight takes d7. Yeah, because your pawn's on g2. Your pawn's one square away from queening, so you're happy to sacrifice your queen on d8 to then take the rook on h1. Mm. And meanwhile, you're attacking the bishop, which is undefended, so you're guaranteed to win material here. What happens if you take with the bishop on bishop takes d7 instead of knight? Then you don't win anything because bishop takes g2. Oh, that's like the, the threat of taking on g5 is real. Exactly. This is a really funny tactic, like to get out of check and leave your queen hanging, but goes to show when you have a pawn so close to promoting, you can do weird stuff. Yeah. They they would think it's like an intermezzo move where they could take on d7 and then take on g g2 later. Exactly, yeah. Like a lot of players would be inclined to just take with check. Um now, okay, if white takes on g2 immediately, it's probably the best move, and then you just take back and it's a playable position. Like it's it's dynamic, like you could probably outplay weaker players, and if you prepare it well enough, you can be okay against stronger players as well. But again, it's a very rare line, so I don't think you would <laughs> encounter this too often. Not even in leeches, wow, that's crazy. Uh, yeah, I, I will say much more common is knight g5. With the idea to eventually reposition the knight on f4, and get some kind of bind where white would eventually like to play h4 to reinforce the knight and prevent you from playing g5. Mm -hmm. And I've studied this opening before, and there's a move that is really interesting here to play h6. Uh, usually white will play knight to h3. And then you can play g5, uh, which looks way overextending, like you've, you've spent almost the full opening just pushing kingside pawns. Um, 
but the, you're you're really putting the question to the night, like what is it doing on each three? And uh, surprisingly, one of the the most common moves here for white is to play knight to g1. Um, and this this is a line which again it, it's pretty less common in the database, like for the black side. Um, but black scores quite quite reasonably. Like it, it's uh, if we look at this position after h6. Uh, it's about even, like 30, 34, 34, 32, so at about, about 50 games. Um, and I think it leads to reasonable play. Like, your next several moves are going to be quite natural, like knight of 6, bishop g7, probably throw in d6, maybe later maneuver your knight to g6. And you just want to make sure your, your pawns are reinforced and not becoming uh, becoming targets. Wow, Yasser, Yasser played this in 90. <laughs> yeah, I, I remember looking at the Yasser game. Um, this line? Wow. Yeah, I have very clear memories, because I, I used to play this from the white side. I think Yasser's opponent played knight g1, if I'm not mistaken. He did, wow. With the idea to play h4 next, and then after bishop g7, was it h4? Or no, Yasser probably played some different move, maybe knight f6. Yeah, you're right. And then I have some vague memory of the king walking to g6. I'll just go ahead and insert this game. <laughs> Be inspired by Yasser. Oh, he played g4, which looks really anti-positional because it gives <laughs> us f4 square. But it keeps the king side closed, so the black king will actually be safe. And knight h5 is... is crazy like black is disobeying so many opening principles i like uh, <laughs> putting the knight on the edge moving the same piece twice but the idea is to fight for control maybe even having ideas of g3 moving the same knight again <laughs> oh he wants to uh he wants to maybe do this he might also want to like do this and this like c65 get some french structure Yeah, the king side is under control. Wow. Yeah, very strange game. You made it work. <laughs> look, these... <laughs> all the pawns. <laughs> yeah, like, you'll look at Yasser games, and sometimes they're, they're like, just really weird and crazy to understand, but sometimes he'll have, like, really interesting ideas in the opening. Um, if you enjoy the style, I, I can recommend looking at Yasser games. Yeah, I don't know much about the game, but is this his style of like kind of crazy and wild? Well, he's he likes to be he likes to be a genius, where he'll come up with kind of really crazy ideas and then just make them work somehow. Um, one game that really comes to mind is um, if you type in, you can do a Google search, Yasser King D7. There's some game where like randomly in the opening he just plays King D7 instead of developing anything. And, like, it was a brilliant move, and it, it led to just incredible play. It was like some Benoni. It was a brilliant structure. move? <laughs> ah, it was, a, it was like a Pierce opening. Mm. And, like, he's really underdeveloped, but he plays King D7, and then... If you're interested, I can, uh, I'll just bring in the game as a new chapter. Oh, sure. It's, it's the type of thing, like, you probably don't want to consume too much of especially, like, before going into a tournament, because then, then you'll be, like, overly inspired to do crazy stuff, and then it won't work out. Um, that happened to me once. Like, I have I went to a chess camp, and the lecture was, like, all about sacrifice, positional sacrifices. And then I played a tournament, and then every game I wanted to play a positional sacrifice, but nothing worked. But, like, some sometimes, like, very specific scenarios, it will uh, be playable. Nice. And let me write the other guy's name down. Who was the guy you said to follow to, for offbeat openings? Igor? Oh, Igor Gleck. Yeah. Igor. I think there's an opening named after him, too. But you can just, like... Um, I mean, he's an older player. But sometimes you can, like, just go to his chessgames.com, like, profile sure. and just, like, start going through games. Or even... Go to chessgames.com and type in the eco code of a certain opening. Mm -hmm. Like if you wanted, do you know? Are you familiar with eco codes? Uh, I'm not, but I'm, I can look them up. I, I'm good with Google searching. 
Okay, this is actually a useful tip if if you want to look for games in a certain opening uh, by a certain player. I'll just give you one example that, um, like, let's say you want to look at four knights with a3. Sure, yeah. Uh, we can see in Lee Chess, this says c46 on the top where it identifies the opening. Well, are you on the white openings tab? What am I looking at? Uh, turn off Stockfish. Okay. Um, go scroll up. To white wait, openings? Wait. <laughs> Oh, white openings, yes. Okay, yeah, yeah, I was making sure. Uh, and then scroll up in the notation. Uh, the notation. Um... Do you see my screen? I'm not sure if you do. Yeah, I see your screen. So turn off opening book. And then go all the way back to move one. Yeah, so you see C46. Like, we'll say the name of the opening. Right? Oh, here. Yeah. Oh, and sometimes it will change depending what happens. So C46, I see it. So I'm going to just do a quick Google search of Igor Glack C46, and it should come up in chessgames.com. Yeah, so I'll, I'll send a link in this chat here of... Uh, of what you would search in chess games, and then you can find all the games by Gleck where it matches the opening code. Oh, that's pretty badass. He's played this so many times. What the heck? Now, actually, he, he I think he plays G3 more than A3, and unfortunately they share the same opening code. Oh, uh, I see. So you might have to do some further digging. Oh, I see. Instead of A3, it's G3. Hmm. Uh, but there are games I know with, with A3 played. But yeah, he probably plays G3 more often. Cool. Thanks for showing me this. Yeah, and th this is a feature that I was going to say, if you if you had chess base, it's easier to kind of filter through players. But mm -hmm. com combining like Lee Chess and ChessGames.com can usually be good enough. Um, and maybe this wasn't the best example because it, it shows uh, <laughs> this G3 comes up more often. But for other... Other openings it can like it can uh, work quite well. Yeah. Okay. Fantastic. Cool. I, I'm looking at the Yasu game by the way. I move 14, king d7. Yeah, it's that's pretty. It just cool. kind of comes out of nowhere, but the, the king is completely safe on the queen side, and the whole idea was to connect the the rook and the queen, so rook h8 can be played, and then eventually later on the queen comes to h8. And everything came into place. It was an amazing coordination of the black pieces in the <laughs> middle game. Yeah, I would. That's not my first candidate move at all. I'd probably play like. Yeah, like I, I like to show this position to people because it's just so out of the out of the ordinary. Um, and if you like this, there's another. Uh, I think there's Karpov King E7 against Komsky. Where we played in the middle game, just randomly. It's just, yeah, it's just so random. Yeah, it's a beautiful Karpov game, actually. At some point, if you want to stay organized, I'd recommend maybe moving these games to a different study. Like maybe have have a study just devoted for, like, classic games. Um, but feel free to take a look at these in your own time. Um, cause we, we can still focus on openings if you'd like. What? He pinned his king to the... <laughs> yeah, but the, the idea is he wants to play g5. But he can't play g5 right away because bishop takes g5. The whole idea is to, um, <laughs> to guard the rook. And amazingly, it's so hard to stop g5. g5 traps the white queen. Oh. So, so you have to play... So, like, you gotta... So yeah. Komsky was provoked basically to give away a pawn. The, the main line was knight e5, and then black just won a pawn. Like queen a5 check and black is up a pawn. There are still issues with the king, but it was enough to eventually win the game. Nice. Apparently, like, this is opening theory now. Like, king e7 is the most played move in this position. Little car fall. Okay, sweet. Yeah, um, I think we were just finishing off the Grand Prix, or like the reverse Grand Prix. Oh, yeah, with this knight f3 line and then f5e4. 
Yeah. Um, but I think I think the most important thing is that now you have a starting point. Mm-hmm. So with all of these lines, like um, at least you you kind of have a starting point where you you know the first few moves, and then ultimately you'll probably get a position where it won't be determined in the opening. It'll be determined later on in the game, but hopefully it will give you some momentum. Like you'll you'll kind of know the the early ideas, mm-hmm. and that's that will hopefully be a better place than where you were maybe a week ago where you were thinking for five minutes on move two. Sure, sure. 